This is Spartan 117. Anyone hear me? Over. Isolate that signal. Master Chief, you mind telling me what you're doing on that ship? Sir, finishing this fight. Welcome back to Finish the Fight, a Halo podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Reiners. And I'm your host, Alex Kendall. And as always, let's go through just a really quick community update because there's not too much going on right now, but PC flights for Halo 2 and Halo 2 Anniversary are going on right now. And of, and of course, as we expected, it looks good. It looks great. So really excited once that goes public and even see the streams on PC and see how gorgeous it's going to look. Yeah, the only other tiny update, if you guys haven't noticed yet, I think it's been the last two or three weeks when we're recording this. Uh, on Halo 5, if you haven't jumped in in a while, they're giving out rec packs that are a bunch of legendary exp- RP. Is it RP and experience or just RP packs? Uh, You're asking the wrong guy. Yes. I can't think off the top of my head. Either way, go check that out. They're giving 40... I think it's RP packs for both Warzone and Arena. So you can jump in, get those packs, earn a bunch of RP, keep buying those gold packs, keep mm-hmm. experience. So they're trying to get you back to it, get you something to do, you know, during this time. Yeah, a lot, and lots of companies are doing that, which I think is the smartest thing to do right now. This mm-hmm. is a time where we really need to uh, keep our hands busy, yeah. you know. So with that being said, I think this is kind of almost symbolic because one year ago, our first episode, episode one, not episode zero, was Combat Evolved. And so now, 52 weeks later, we're doing Combat Evolved Anniversary. I think the planet's kind of aligned for this one, and it's really cool to do. Mm-hmm. So this is actually going to be kind of two parts for this episode. We are going to go back in time and dive into the original development of the original Combat Evolved just because... And to jump in real quick, by two parts, he means in the same episode. It's broken up in <laughs> yes, half. Yes, just... One episode, It's though. one episode, yeah. So there's two parts within this episode. So we're going to be talking about some things that we've learned in the past year because just, you know, we've done so much more research now than we were when we first started. So we will have a section dedicated just to original Combat Evolved development. And then moving on, we will talk about Combat Evolved Anniversary's development. So with that being said, let's dive right in. Halo Combat Evolved Anniversary is technically the first game released by 343 Industries with the help of Certain Affinity and Saber Interactive. The game was released November 15th, 2011 in the US and November 18th, 2011 in the UK, retelling the story of Master Chief and Cortana in the battle against the Covenant on the mysterious ringworld Halo. So first story told again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Real original, guys. Real original. We know this. You know what you do when you want to put your first game out? Just copy the first one someone else did. (laughs) (laughs) No, but we'll jump a little bit into 343 for you. So 343 Industries is an American video game developer based out of Seattle, Washington. As an internal Microsoft studio, they produce any and all Halo content from the video games down to the books, comics, board games, and kind of any other piece of media that they've had their hands in. Mm -hmm. When Bonnie Ross became the general manager of Halo, she said she read the rest of the books. Previously, she'd only read The Fall of Reach thus far. Mm -hmm. She would state that she would take the job, but she wanted there to be a whole studio just for Halo and that they cover everything Halo like we said, with the books, comics, toys, mm-hmm. they, they kind of bring everything under one house. Yeah, because it was originally just like, okay, you do Halo, and she's like, no, I want to do all. I want to do all the transmedia. Exactly, I, I want everything under this one studio instead mm-hmm. of Microsoft just going your game, your book, your comic. We outsource for the toy. You know, we don't get any hands in everything. But mm-hmm. she's kind of like, no, I want my hands on all of it. We, nothing, you know, nothing is released with a Halo name on it until we approve of Mm -hmm. it, essentially. So Microsoft would task Bonnie Ross to create a new team to take over the Halo IP while Bungie was transitioning out of Microsoft. So Frank O'Connor would help the new Halo team in creating their own Halo Bible, and it was uh, Starlight Runner was the company that was tasked with creating this new Halo Bible. For whatever reason, there must have been something in the fine print where Bungie was like, we're keeping our Halo Bible, because... When 343 had started, they brought in that company to make a new one, which is, I I don't know. I I tried to look into it. I couldn't find anything. It it honestly may come down to, you know, going through the interviews and everything else in the tasks that it may just be, hey, we're going to make our own kind of company 
Halo Bible that will yeah. go by, you know, kind of like if you had like your whole marketing materials, like, no, 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 these are the three for three materials now mm -hmm. and not the Bungie ones. And maybe some old stuff that was left in there that was later not relevant or mm -hmm. never used, stuff like or that. Or updated to, you know, at this point when you have all of your books that will eventually up to Halo 4, mm -hmm. it's what can we kind of keep evolving as we bring those books in? Because we know we want to add the Forerunners, so maybe we add it to that first. Yeah. So O'Connor met Ross and the rest of the small team that would start to take over Halo, and he was rather impressed to see how the new team was so dedicated to the Halo franchise, and that's what sold him on joining the team. Uh, because y you got to remember, Frank O'Connor joined Bungie in 2003 or four mm -hmm. because he loved Halo. So when they were leaving Halo, he's like, I, I don't want to lose this, so I'm going to go through four three. He ends up becoming one of the top guys. I think it all kind of worked out for him. Yeah. But so one of the first teams that would come from 343 Industry was the publishing team. Since Bungie and Ensemble at the time were working on video games, which is, you know, Halo 3, ODST, Reach, and Wars, uh, this would eventually lead to Halo Legends being released. Mm -hmm. Since 343 Industries did also help with the publishing of ODST and Reach. And since then, they have gone on to release Halo CEA, 4, 5, Wars 2, Assault, Strike and Fire Team Raven. Now, I, I will, I am going to say this for our Halo 4 episode, we will dive a lot more into how 343 Industries was formed along with Halo 4's development because it was parallel, it was yeah. happening simultaneously. Yeah, just give a little thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, to jump over now, we're going to look at Certain Affinity. So Certain Affinity is an American video game developer based out of Austin, Texas. Founded in 2006 by Max Hoberman after an internal fallout within Bungie, along with other ex-Bungie employees that he kind of rallied together. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, Certain Affinity helps other studios in the development of their IPs. So the best way to kind of describe this is they're not creating their own properties, they're actually coming in and helping doing map packs and helping mm -hmm. create certain aspects of it, whether it was with Call of Duty or Halo, Left 4 Dead, kind of whatever they got their hands in mm -hmm. that helped with expediting a lot of the process of yeah, it. Yeah, and mainly multiplayer for the most part is where mm -hmm. they're really good at. And they've done really well. And the studio has gone on to work on franchises, like I said, such as Left 4 Dead, Call of Duty, and Halo. Uh, for the first part of Certain Affinity's lifespan, they were unsung heroes in all of these franchises. But over the years, they've made an effort to make themselves known as an important developer in gaming culture. And I really think they have achieved and have continued to achieve it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as I said, when you come in and you are part of the backbone of a studio who needs the help. And even then, they, you know, sometimes they have creative freedom to do things and implement these things. And it's really cool to see that. It's like, oh, this was the brainchild of certain affinity. Like, mm -hmm. they helped a lot with Forge and Halo 4, and we'll, we'll cover that then. But it was really cool to see that. So now moving on, let's talk about, finally, Saber Interactive. Founded in 2001 by Andrew Ions, Matthew Karch, and Anton Krupkin, Saber Interactive is an American video game developer based out of Maplewood, New Jersey. The studio also has offices in St. Petersburg, Madrid, Minsk, and Sunsfall. Since 2001, Saber has worked on original IPs or helped other studios with their IPs over the years. They've gone on to work on the Halo franchise, Witcher franchise, and the NBA franchise. They've also worked on Ghostbusters, the video game Remastered, The Call of Cthulhu, ugh, Shaq Fu, Vampire, and Time Shift. Now, in February of 2020, so only two months ago, the studio was purchased by Embracer Group, becoming a subsidiary. And now we want to give you a little background on remastered games. Because we can't just jump into the episode yet. Yeah, I mean, that term has been really a buzzword since probably the mid-2000s. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we've had some stuff before that I'm going to start with, but it's been a buzzword. It's been thrown around. There's been HD collections. There's been, you know, like The Last of Us remastered mm -hmm. or, or completely redone games. So we're going to break that down. And I wanted to kind of start with a little history on it. So the quote-unquote remasters or kind of, kind of redubs that they've had really started with arcade cabinets. Your upright arcade cabinets that you could play, you know, in your quarter machines, you'd go out to the mall or wherever you're playing those, those cabinets. Then you had things like the Atari and the Nintendo Entertainment System and other systems that started to come out that you could play at home. So what that meant was taking that arcade game that was built for a sticking and a couple buttons and converting it to be able to play on a controller and run in 
really a whole different system build. Mm -hmm. So this involved either stripping some features, adding some features, changing some things around. Like I know with Tapped, is that I, that might be the name of it, but it was an Anheuser Busch propaganda game. And we'll call it a propaganda game, advertising game. <laughs> and what you did in that was you went up and down these bars that you had, like bar tops, and you would slide down these mugs of beer. Well, your tappers originally had like the Anheuser Busch logo and stuff, and they're beer. But when it came to Nintendo, they switched it over to root beer. Nintendo's like, no product placement here, son. No beer, beer specifically. Oh. So so that's a little little history with that. But now we're gonna break it down into a couple of categories, giving you a couple examples as we go through with that. So to start, the most let's say quote unquote generic or the most that usually happens are ports. And yeah. this is where a studio will take a game, let's say from what we have when the new systems come out. So like whenever the 360 was now transitioning into the one, you'd have ports of those older games that would either get some graphical updates, but probably just maybe just throw them over to the new system. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the start for it. And you can have some ports that jump way up that we'll talk about, but for the most part, that's kind of the real thing that you're seeing is trying to cash in again on the same game. Yeah, like hoping people are going to go and buy a copy of it, essentially, or buy it online, or yeah, arcade. But uh, yeah, buy the arcade, or whether it's buy another physical edition of it or a digital edition of it, it's just a repurchase of it. We've seen that in Skyrim, you know, starting in 2011, being on the 360 and the PS3. Now it's been on the Switch One, PS4, PC, the VR. I mean, it's, it's, it's Game Boy it's, Color, everything. Yeah, it's had so many iterations. So that's kind of your poster child for that. So then let's talk about now some graphical and audio updates. So typically, whenever you have these overhaul of the games, you're going to see something go from 720 to 1080p and, you know, 30 frames per second all the way to 60 or 120 frames per second. And you saw a lot of that with The Last of Us Remastered. You have a lot of HD additions taking classic games and giving them graphic overalls, which a decent number of these being ports from consoles just had one generation or so behind. Yeah, because it may have even been a game that was on the cusp of possibly hitting the new console. Mm -hmm. Like we saw with like Grand Theft Auto V. Mm -hmm. Whenever yeah. like it hit 360 and it hit PS3, but then the 1 and 4 came out and then it was on that and then it was on... PC itself. So yeah, you see a lot of these kind of HD remasters or just something, not even calling it that, but you can see the changes they've added. Yeah. Well, then, you know, you also have games like Boulder's Gate, Enhanced Edition, SpongeBob SquarePants, Battle for Bikini Bottom, Rehydrated, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Turtles in Time Reshelled. I love these Rehydrated. I, Resh isn't, that, isn't that great? I, I love it because I, <laughs> I threw SpongeBob in there because I remember playing that game religiously with my sisters. Mm -hmm. It was the one game that they loved to play when they were young. Yeah. And so when I saw that that was on the list of it, I was like, oh. I, I knew that, that was a there. personal choice. Oh, I was 100%. like, this, this isn't the poster child for HD edition games. Oh, 100%. But, you know, moving on then, we also have collections, which is a collection of games that culminates, you know, within a family of games into one title. So, of course, the one that everyone here knows is Halo Master Chief Collection. But we also have Super Mario All-Stars. Which I believe looking it up was one of the first to do it. So Probably. that was the one on the Super Nintendo that brought all of the OG Marios from the Nintendo, plus some of the stuff that was released early on for the Super Nintendo into one combo pack. N Nintendo loves to just be like, here's four games in one. I had I had it for Game Boy Advance mm -hmm. as well, like a, a Super Mario Advance or whatever it was, which came with like two or three games. Yeah, and then now we also have rumors with a, with a possible leak of a full HD remastered edition of Mario 64, mm -hmm. Mario Sunshine, and the other one. Yes. That I'd never played. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know in, in our household we're excited for 64. Mm -hmm. Like, that should be fun. But then, you know, we also have Spyro Reignited Trilogy, which we actually do have. Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy, we also have for some reason. <laughs> Devil May Cry HD Collection. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater HD, and Uncharted The Nathan Drake Collection. We also have remakes or full builds of the game. And what this really entails is taking an IP that they honestly build from the ground up again. So they're really keeping the same game and the same nature of it, but giving a complete overhaul and either adding a lot of stuff to it, giving a full graphical update, and honestly having to build the game again. So to give you some mm -hmm. examples, you have Pokemon Red and Blue. 
Your yep. OG Pokemons. Well, then you had for the Game Boy Advance, which was Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green. Yeah. And most recently for the Switch, you have Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee. So mm-hmm. that game in and of itself has seen so many iterations yeah. as it's gone through. Well, they've even done those kind of, not remakes, but uh, upgrades for all, a bunch of games, even up to like Ruby and Sapphire mm-hmm. at this yeah, point. Yeah, because you have Ultra Ruby, Ultra Sapphire, I think it yeah. was. I think even beyond that point, it's hard to keep up with it. Yeah, and, and Pokemon's one that has done it really well, and they're smart about it because... Well, I remember when when Fire Red, Leaf Green, people were like, oh, it's updated and it looks good? Yes, I will buy that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We also have Final Fantasy VII coming out, mm-hmm. which we're seeing that looks amazingly beautiful. Nothing like its PS1, PS2 equivalent of it, whatever PS1. that was. PS1. I remember playing that. Seeing this now is really cool to be able to see mm-hmm. just the huge updates to it, which is beautiful. Obviously, Resident Evil HD 2 and 3 which just launched. Uh, We have The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, which had a full overhaul of what it is. It's the same game, pretty much, but now you get this cute little blobby sprite instead of having that 2D of it. All of Nintendo's 3D remakes for the 3DS. Yeah. So 64 3D, uh, Ocarina of Time 3D, Mm -hmm. Star Fox. So all of those 3Ds in there had to get a different space for it. Shadow of the Colossus, which is a really big one, and Perfect Dark, which was one of the original games I got for the 360. Hmm. I've never played that. It was a, it was a fun one. You exploited a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so then let's talk about just overall reboots. So games that come from an existing brand that may share a title but are conceptually very different. So we have Tomb Raider that originally came out in 1996 and Tomb Raider that came out in 2013. GoldenEye 007 1997. But then also GoldenEye 007 Reloaded. So I got to put those cool names at the end. So originally didn't have Reloaded when it just came to the GameCube mm-hmm. uh, or Wii. I, re- I think it was Wii. I think it was, was it Wii? Because they, they put Dino Craig in it instead of Bronson mm-hmm. and changed a little bit of it up, but kept the same thing. It's really weird. Yeah. But that came out in 2011. Then we have Doom 2016, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2019, Wolfenstein 2009. Thief 2014, that's one of the six games I've ever played, FYI. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sonic the Hedgehog in 2006. Which, hands down, is probably one of the worst games of all time. Is it? Uh, It is one of the biggest critical failures that has ever happened. Huh. Other than, actually, no, the movie actually did really well for some reason. Never mind on that. Prey 2017 and Hitman in 2016. (laughs) And if any of you have played the original Prey which was a 360, I'm going to call it, I'm sticking with Xbox, it was probably on everything, but a 360 game where you played a Native American and you like got abducted by aliens at this bar, as opposed to the newer Prey, which is set on a futuristic space station. And there are, I guess, some similarities, possibly, but from what I remember, I really don't think there are. Mm -hmm. And then we have fan remakes. And these are games that are created by fans of the series from like a full build, just taking the idea of the IP Mm -hmm. or using their source game, source engine to create new content. So we saw that in Half-Life where we got Black Mesa. From GoldenEye 007, another look at it, we had GoldenEye Source, Pokemon Uranium. I don't know if you ever played that ROM hack. I I never did. I wanted to so bad. I know it got shut down so quickly. It was really fun. And I love the backstory. It's that there was like nuclear fallout and your dad, Mm -hmm. your family died. So you went to live with your aunt and Pokemon are now going crazy killing people. Or uh, attacking was there, people. Okay, I, I was like, killing? Yeah, attacking people. A little dark. Tomato, tomato. Yeah. Uh, Installation 01, Star Fox Shadows of Lilat, Halo Curse Edition, and Skywin, which is a mod for Oblivion, or no, sorry, Morrowind, but it's brought to Skyrim. So it kind of Skywind, Morrowind, mm, so it brings it up there. All right, so let's wrap this all up and let's talk about D-Makes. So taking a more advanced game and taking it to a more obsolete console, such as taking a 3D game and turning it into a 2D game. So first off, we have Halo 2600. I would love to do a bonus episode about this in the future, just an FYI. Mm-hmm. Go join our Patreon and we go vote for it. Uh, we have Quest, Brian's Journey, which is an official Game Boy port for the Quest 64. We have Princess Rescue, a D-Make of Super Mario Bros. for the Atari 2600. And then Super Smash Land, a Game Boy-style demake of Super Smash Bros. 
with that being said, you have now some more backstory about remakes and HD upgrades and everything like that. Go go tell it the next party you go to in five <laughs> months or so. Mm-hmm. But with that being said, now let's dive into some original Combat Evolved development. So, so as we said earlier, we weren't as invested in research as we are now. So even just researching combat evolved anniversary stuff we've we've come across some really cool things that we would like to just share with you guys essentially my criteria is would this have made it in the original combat evolved Mm -hmm. episode so this is all stuff i found interesting enough so we're going to tell you now so let's start off with the fact that at the time of halo combat evolves development marty o'donnell wasn't actually a bungie employee yet he was still a contractor and so This one's a lot more interesting. There was almost no music for the original Halo trailer at the Macworld 1999 presentation. You know, that thing that Halo is kind of known for. Mm -hmm. So Marty had written and recorded the music heard at Macworld presentation only a few days prior to this event. We've all seen this just for some backstory. This is where Steve Jobs, you know, kind of introduced who Bungie were and who Jason Jones were. And they took over from there and they played that old third person cinematic Mm -hmm. for it. So the music was actually recorded the Monday before Joe Staten and Jason Jones would leave on a plane to go to New York that afternoon. Joe had actually asked Marty the day prior if he could tone down the music. They're in the middle of recording it, said since Jason Jones was supposed to be talking over the presentation. But Marty insisted that Jones not talk over the presentation. He's like, how about you just change everything and let my music kind of just come out? Mm -hmm. Plus, he had said that the wheels were already moving and you couldn't change anything at this point. So the song was recorded in one day, burnt onto one CD and given to Jones in Staten. Marty went home that night and he went to bed. The next morning... Marty woke up to a voicemail. The CD that he had given Staten and Jones was actually broken during the flight. Luckily, when Marty went home that night from the studio, Michael Salvatore, his business partner, had stayed behind at the studio and would receive a second copy of the CD. So Marty met up with Mike Salvatore that morning to get the second CD, and he barely made it in time to get the CD overnighted to Jones and Staten. So who knows what would have happened if they just played they're just like looking around they're like oh here's 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 some guys they do some (laughs) things thank you very much we we love mac world (laughs) and it worked out too because uh uh, steve jobs did tell jones like you actually don't need to talk for this presentation you can play your demo and marty's like didn't matter my music's crazy anyways you Mm -hmm. just gotta shut your mouth and listen to it yeah exactly which i always love just seeing all these moments where they're like you shouldn't do that and he's like I'm going to do that. My music's going to be like this. And one idea that they had that we obviously are kind of seeing it expand upon Mm -hmm. uh, is that Cortana was originally going to turn evil. Yeah, that's when uh, Chief plugs her into the control system of Halo. Originally, he was supposed to come back. She was supposed to be crazy and want to kill humanity. Doesn't sound familiar. No, not at all. (laughs) So I I think that also expanded out when... Because you never think like, hey, I'm going to make this property... And it's going to expand 20 years. So you try and think of the story, you know, in one chunk. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, also, each Marine had their own unique voice, which I find really cool that it wasn't, I never felt crazy repetitive, like in some games around that time where you might have like maybe two voice actors yeah. that did 50 lines a piece. Yeah. For Bungie has always killed it with the idea that there are unique Marines out there in a certain part when you run into them. And so for our, you know, next tidbit of information, Marty originally wrote a love song in Combat Evolved, but cut it out. Because I think it was ambiguous as to what the relationship was between Chief and Cortana was at the time. Mm -hmm. So he wrote it. They're just like, nope, and never saw the light of day. That is weird. So when designing the races, characters, and technologies of Halo, it was split between three factions, as well as three designers. Shi Kai Wang took the Covenant, Marcus Leto took the Humans, and Eddie Smith did the Forerunner designs. Before the infamous Halo 2 grind... Halo CE's development around the end wasn't too far off. Many employees were working 16-hour days and then sleeping at their desks, waking up with drool across their face the next morning and just doing it all over again. Incredible. Yeah, so it wasn't... uh, Games really didn't have that much crunch time as you're seeing into the mid-late 2000s, but obviously they had a lot to do Mm. having done this game like seven times. Yeah, they had a year, (laughs) maybe not like nine months to make it uh, from a PC game to an Xbox game and also kind of rewrite everything. It was crazy. Mm -hmm. And there's an urban legend 
that Jason Jones upped the power of the pistol around the end of development for CE so that he could be better at his own game. I would have done that too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this was really due to the fact that when it was almost time to ship the game, the studio was still debating on the right balance for the pistol and any change they made would start a domino effect of more code they would have to change. Jones would state that he eventually changed a line of code on the pistol, so when a map loaded, it would change a single number on the pistol. And quote, I will take the credit and blame for the pistol in Halo. I'll take the blame for everything in Halo CE. So Jason Jones would also state the thing that he was most unhappy with when it came to Combat Evolve's development was the lack of time Xbox launch as an inflexible deadline. So mm -hmm. They weren't controlling on when this is coming out. Microsoft's like, no, you're ours. You work for us. We'll probably fire you if you don't do this. So, and then also around 40 Bungie employees developed Combat Evolved, which is crazy to me thinking now you go into Halo 4 when it's like 300. Mm -hmm. Like, it's so crazy. Granted, there are some contractors in there and whatnot, and some Microsoft employees did help. But for the most part, it was that core team that did a lot of it. Yeah. A little tidbit for you. Maroon 5 kept putting off recording songs about Jane to play CE in the studio. Amazing. I mean, I think pretty much everybody did at that point. <laughs> and the Halo theme was inspired by one of the worst bands out there, the Beatles, Yesterday Melody. That, I, say what you will about the Beatles, that is very interesting. That, oh, I think it's, I think it's great. Like, because I, I, I've watched Marty O'Donnell like break it down because, of course, he has a master's in music something. I don't know. Yeah, but that's <laughs> usually when you go to the university and they're like, music, uh, something, just give me something. Just give me a degree. But he breaks down like how many high notes, like the highest notes it has and lows. It's crazy. So yeah. I thought that was really, really interesting. By the way, that was hashtag hot take. Hit me in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> so when Steve Downs was approached about voicing the Master Chief, he was told, quote, he's a super soldier, a man of few words, a lone wolf, a guy in a spacesuit. You never see his face behind his reflective helmet visor. Think spaghetti westerns, Clint Eastwood, but in space. So that's kind of what sold him because that's the coolest description ever of anyone. We'd have a really different chief if that last sentence ended with, think spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought about that. What's the, he's just like, what's the context? And they're like, no. Hey, it's a me, a master chief. <laughs> So a few months after the release of Halo, Steve Downs was visiting a friend's place in Florida and saw some kids playing Halo. He mentioned that he voiced a character, but forgot the name of the character. <laughs> when the kids asked if it was Master Chief, he kind of thought about it and said, yeah, yeah, yeah I did that. that. About 30 minutes later, all the kids in the neighborhood, which is around 35 kids, were at the house having him sign copies of Halo Combat Evolved in their Xboxes. That's awesome. And that's when he was like, Oh, this is like a big deal. And then he said he he drove by like a GameStop or some game store and he like saw the Master Chief like front and center. He's like, oh, oh, OK, cool. cool. I just love that. He's like, I think Master, I don't, I don't know the guys. Like, I Master Chief. That, that sounds right. It's like the, that's right, the right amount of syllables I kept hearing. Yeah, I believe that's it. Bungie did at one point consider replacing Steve Downs with a celebrity voice actor after the release of C.E., Mm -hmm. You know, because you have your main character who is, you know, like the, the machismo, awesome, few liners, but now the property's big. So it's like, we need to get someone in that people will recognize, Yeah, but that was kind of decided against, and I think rightly so. And then, last little tidbit for you, Jen Taylor went to college with Joe Statton. Small world. Small, Small world little stuff. world. All right, so now... We're finally at the point that you guys have been wanting to hear. Let's talk about the early stages of development of the legendary Combat Evolved anniversary. So Frank O'Connor said that Combat Evolved anniversary was 10 years in the making. So after the release of Halo 2, fans would always want a new version of Combat Evolved with updated graphics. And over the years, they became more and more vocal about it, filling the Bungie and 343 Industries forums expressing their interest in a remake. As early as 2009, 343 Industries would start to conceptualize the Halo Combat Evolved anniversary project, even though originally Bonnie Ross said no to the project, which is very surprising because she thought it's sacred ground. We can't do literally anything to it. But I think the studio was event uh, was able to convince her otherwise. Like, chill. Yeah, to be like, hey, we're not actually really touching it per se. We're giving it a graphical update. We're bringing it to the new system. And yeah. it's honestly just a marketing piece. Yeah, and that's something we'll start to talk about here soon. So at first, 
pre-production was hectic. 343 Industries needed to look to outside studios who could help with this vision, leading to Saber Interactive. And I think at the time they were already working with certain affinity as well. Mm -hmm. So the decision to go with Saber was a surprise to some, considering that they were a smaller independent studio that hadn't previously worked on the Halo IP or any really big IPs at the time. They're still doing some small scale stuff. Mm -hmm. So Saber Interactive had to write a new program and engine that would integrate new graphics and audio with the old Combat Evolved gameplay code. The updated graphics would take inspiration from Halo 3 and Halo Reach, but any new assets would come from the minds of 343 Industries and Saber Interactive. Frank O'Connor on multiple occasions had to talk to Saber Interactive out of overreaching in the remake and leaving their mark on the game. This game needed to reflect the icon released 10 years ago prior, and it needed to be a testament to the Halo franchise. So Saber was like, no, we can change the gameplay a little bit and, and do this and this. And Frank it's like, no, you can't. Like, you cannot change anything. Well, yeah, especially like, we can update it. We can get it to be like a modern day game. And he's like, no, we need, it needs to basically be a time capsule that we've like cleaned. Yeah, and, like, like polished. polish it off a yeah. little bit, like put makeup on it. Yeah. So, so it, yeah, <laughs> it's a corpse that we're dressing up. <laughs> so all you can see it. <laughs> All right, so Dan Ayub had this to say about Combat Evolved Anniversary. The best way to do Halo Combat Evolved justice was to change as little as possible, and it quickly became our mantra for the game, that it needed to play exactly the same as it did when you look at all the features and graphical improvements that are additive to the core gameplay. But we wanted to make sure that the game played identically so that the one thing that we made sure we didn't mess with... It was never an option for 343 Industries to just make the original graphics a higher res and high definition. They wanted the graphics to compare to modern shooters, and it makes sense. Mm -hmm. The idea to toggle graphics in the game was from Chad Armstrong, super, super smart. Mm -hmm. The ability to switch back and forth was only there for developers, but the first thing he would do at 343 Industries after being hired was state that the feature needed to be shipped with the game. Yeah, so I think that's incredible because they were just going to release the HD thing, mm -hmm. and he was like, why Why isn't this just part of the game? Yeah, it's, it's literally push the back button, mm -hmm. and it does it. If we can have it in developer mode, like, why can't we do it for them? Mm -hmm. And it made sense. I remember first picking it up, not really paying attention, and, like, I think pushing it to, for some reason, check my score or something on campaign. Uh, I don't know what I was doing. Switch grenades or something. Something yeah. like that. I was like, oh. That's actually really cool. Like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm playing yeah. the old school one. Like, yeah. So it, it was definitely a good surprise. Early on in development, 343 Industries would consult with Bungie developers to make sure they stayed true to the original CE gameplay. They even made a list of popular bugs gathered from old Bungie forums and ran them by Bungie employees to make sure that they checked out. 343 Industries made sure that Bungie would get plenty of copies of CEA, once it was released. Can you imagine like that game that gave them so much dismay? They all show up to the office and there's just a pile of them and they're just they just kick them over and like go back to work on Destiny. I that probably did not happen, but I can just imagine. Just all that PTSD just coming back from it. <laughs> they all just Pizza start and socks. I can't do it right now. <laughs> <laughs> and f finally, 343 Industries wanted to keep the core of Combat Evolved true to the original game and would look to keep the original campaign mostly the same. Frank O'Connor would state that this wasn't a, quote, Star Wars remake. This would include keeping the amount of dead AIs the same that would appear in the original version and even keeping some glitches and imbalances, which sometimes became an issue with trying to differentiate old bugs from new bugs. So you're like, that bug was in there, it was never patched, but it's it's... Left its mark. It's mm -hmm. kind of like nostalgic that with bug, it. That bug's king bug right now. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's good bug. That's bad bug. How do we differentiate <laughs> when we're running this through? In fact, when the game was ported to 360, a lot of the bugs were fixed in the process automatically, so they had to go in and reprogram them back into the game. Like, 360's like, oh, dude, you missed some bugs? I'll fix it for you. Don't worry about it. Like, no, 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 no. Can you imagine? It's like one of those things you have a car that has a few dents. You're like, I like that. And then someone fixes it. So you have to go and like take a hammer and dent the car again. That's essentially what happened. Yep. And you're like, I don't want to do this. <laughs> At one point, it was said internally that if they couldn't do the Warthog jump, they couldn't ship the game. 343 Industries didn't even adjust the difficulties. They just would alter a couple things like changing how the elites stood and Better lighting and hard to see missions. Makes sense, because that's not really affecting the gameplay unless you're just like not continuously running into a wall. You're like, oh, there's a hallway down here. And for people who may not have played it in 10 years, 
that may just be a welcome thing you don't remember. Mm, yeah. So there was a beta that would start October 4th, 2011, a super short one, even though it was probably unnecessary, really, because they were using Reach's engine for multiplayer, which mm-hmm. we'll get into later. Moving on to later stages of development. Initially, fans speculated about the Combat Evolved remake, but after seeing job listings on 343 Industries' website, many would assume that they were just going to go to another studio to develop the remake entirely because 343 Industries was just going to have a hands-off approach to it and work on 4. Mm -hmm. Uh, In early 2011, though, more and more rumors would start to rise and speculate that Combat Evolved would, in fact, get a remake, and websites would start to report on these rumors. This all started from Joystick claiming that an unnamed source had told them that the remake was indeed official. These rumors would also state that there was a second game in development from 343 Industries. It was finally confirmed during Microsoft's E3 2011 event that there was going to be a Combat Evolved anniversary remake. So even after the event, Microsoft was pretty reluctant to release official screenshots of the game until it almost released, though they had released a handful after the initial announcement. So 343 Industries spent about six or seven months deciding on how Chief would look in Combat Evolved. Like he did in the original. Just mm-hmm. more graphics. I don't get why this is an issue. Hey, more, more polys. More, <laughs> more <pixels. laughs> polys. Because originally 343 Industries was just going to use the Mark V armor from Halo Reach for Chief. And they've even showed some footage. It doesn't look right. No. Yeah, and of course, it didn't feel right. So later, they would look to reskin his armor, but throw their interpretive spin on it, bad move, which left a bad taste in fans' mouths after presenting it at E3 2011. This was one of the few times that 343 would rely on anecdotal complaints when it came to major decisions about making a character, considering Chief's look in Combat Evolved was so iconic. People thought they were being funny. People were like, oh, it's ironic. They're like, like, they're like, oh, April Fools. Yeah, so they're, good. They're like, oh, it's a throwback to the old, old chief when he had like the really big visor. And everyone's like, no, that's our chief. And they're like, kill it. Yeah, kill it with just fire. Burn it. Players have the ability to switch back and forth between classic graphics and new graphics, like we said. These are actually two engines running on top of each other. One engine powers the gameplay and physics, and the other powers the graphics. In some places in the campaign, the resolution was boosted by 8,000%, and Chief's graphics now having 300% more resolution. Frank O'Connor stated that this was done because 343 Industries would, quote, never try to replicate what Bungie did. Uh, I'm going to say, I have no idea why he said that. I'm just going to... But that's the only time I could... Like, I read that interview, I found that quote, and I made sure that that interview wasn't, Mm -hmm. like, out of line and misquoting Just a random interview, yeah. No, he literally said that about updating graphics. I don't get it, whatever. Why wouldn't wouldn't you want to replicate it? You're replicating (laughs) it! That's literally what you're doing. That's what you're doing. And the original graphics, obviously, were boosted up to 1080p. Mm -hmm. And on October 15th, 2011, development would officially be finished, and the game was ready to be shipped to manufacturers. And to wrap it up with a little little tidbits, little, mm-hmm. little triv bits, we might say, the working title for the game was called Spark. Why? <laughs> it's not a secret IP. It's not like we're like, oh, we're designing the GameCube. We're designing the Dolphin. It's like, mm, no, you're you're making the same game. <laughs> but I get that you don't want it to be released out to the public. Mm-hmm. It makes sense. System Link is still an option for multiplayer and co-op campaign. There you go. One can actually access the debug menu in the game. I think that might have since been patched, but initially at launch, you could do some wizardry on your controller and get the debug so you can cheat and just be invincible. Mm -hmm. And the game would release for the low, low, low price of $39.99. I didn't even know that until I went to pre-order it. Because, fun fact, I will say, this was my first Halo Midnight release. So, technically... It would be like the first for everybody. Exactly. Just Ten years later. So I'll tell you, like, what's your first minute release? Combat Evolved. Yeah. Uh, you just go, Combat Evolved. Uh. uh. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about what's new. So the first thing we have is Connect integrations, which we'll explore it's, 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 a little it's more. It's one of everyone's favorite integration with the 360. <laughs> Everyone <laughs> loved that in every game. Who didn't love a horror game where if anyone in your house made a sound? They would know you were there. (laughs) Oh, so good. (laughs) Then we have uh, stereoscopic 3D support. So the player would, though, need a TV that supports 3D. 
We had terminals for the first mm -hmm. time, and these were placed throughout the missions to give insight into Halo 4's story. The context of the terminal and the information provided was mm -hmm. also sometimes relate to where they were in the map. We had a re-recorded soundtrack along with re-recorded sound effects. And remember, this is all new stuff for Combat Evolved. Sure. We also had online co-op campaign and multiplayer. We have achievements for the first time and also firefight. So four player available via Xbox Live or two players on split screen. And as well as we had skulls for the first time. So the skulls implemented in Combat Evolved were mainly skulls that did not affect the AI, but but rather the player due to 343 Industries not wanting to tamper too much with the core gameplay. Skulls are not available in classic mode though. So. It's true. If you if you go back and forth and you're in the same location, it's obviously not seen there graphically mm -hmm. and you won't get it. But if you go to your upgraded CEA graphics, it's there and you can grab mm -hmm. it. We also have campaign scory and subtitles for in-game and combat dialogue. And finally, Guilty Spark's lines were updated to reflect events happening in the extended lore. So Tim Dadabo, and it's probably later in the notes, does come back and, and record some more lines. And now we dabble into a little bit of marketing aspect for you. With the first soft release from 343i, Microsoft wouldn't go all in with the marketing but they would test the waters, you know, try out new, some new tactics to kind of see what would help transfer over to the marketing for Halo 4. There, there is some stuff that they said this worked for Combat Evolved the Anniversary. We're doing this for Halo 4. Mm -hmm. So now we're over to E3 2011. And shortly before this, a leaked screenshot would appear online from Microsoft showing they planned on announcing Halo CEA and Halo 4. The trailer for Combat Evolved Anniversary and the teaser trailer for Halo 4 would actually leak the morning of the conference. And this is the amount of leaks that we're going to talk about in our Halo 4 episode is like could be its own episode. It's it's amazing. I and, love it. And in modern day, it's always a question is, was that a leak or was that a quote unquote leak well a lot of musicians leak their own albums yeah. because people who really want a physical edition or want they want like a copy of the vinyl or something like that'll help sure and 343 would announce and premiere halo cea with showcasing a remastered look at the silent cartographer they would also officially announce halo 4 and the start of a new trilogy Yep. So then we have the Tokyo Game Show. So at this conference, 343 Industries would announce the return of the classic map headlong, along with a demo of the level, the Pillar of Autumn. It's always weird that they are doing Tokyo Game Show. People have always questioned why they do that, because it's they're not popular over there, but I digress. So then we have Heroes Never Die. The live action trailer shows a general giving a speech to a room full of UNSC soldiers honoring the brave dead who fought the Human Covenant War, ending it by stating that they are revealing a living monument. And this trailer is in fact tied into the interactive living monument uh, which we're going to talk about right now. A few weeks before the launch of Combat Evolved Anniversary, Fusible would find a website registered to Microsoft revolving around a monument to Combat Evolved Anniversary, even though the website itself wasn't really complete yet. I think it was just like a background and it had like everything else, but it was clear something should have been in the center. Yeah, it was just a placeholder site. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a day before the release of Combat Evolved Anniversary, the monument would be available for fans to interact with. The monument itself was a giant interactive 3D mosaic Master Chief, which was Combat Evolved era, holding a pistol, which was actually the recreation of the Combat Evolved Anniversary cover. Mm -hmm. So all one had to do was pick a spot on the giant chief statue Upload a photo from Facebook or Twitter and leave a comment. Though unlike the Reach statue, the photos in the statue would not disappear. So this one wasn't run by the Microsoft Silver. What is it? Silverlight. Sil Silverlight. So I could actually noodle with it and I tried to upload a photo and it's just like, no. So I was like, <laughs> ah. It's like no. the one time I could do this, I can't. And now we have Halo Fest. So 343 Industries would partner with the Penny Arcade Expo for Halo Fest, a 10-year anniversary celebrating all things Halo. At this event, fans could see panels with 343i employees discussing the game, along with the first chance to get a hands-on preview of said game. I think they did have a few Bungie employees. I think Marty was there for sure. Yeah, whoever was still around, they probably just toted them mm -hmm. on the whole Marketing Express train, basically. <laughs> like, you're going to that thing. We also had a pre-order bonus. If one were to have pre-ordered CEA like Jesse, 
they would have received a Master Chief avatar armor along with the grunt funeral skull. This skull would turn fallen grunts into grenades, which will eventually see that skull come into Master Chief collection. Mm -hmm. So now let's move on to early access. So Microsoft would team up with Game, which is like the GameStop of the UK, mm -hmm. uh, to allow fans to play Combat Evolved early in the UK on November 4th, 2011 at the Game Station in Birmingham, New Street, and again on November 12th, 2012 at Game in Kingston. Both these events would allow fans to enter to win a limited edition Xbox 360 console, Connect, which they threw out instantly, an <laughs> Xbox 360 Bluetooth headset, 10,000 Microsoft points, an Xbox Live Gold subscription, and a copy of Combat Evolved Anniversary with many more prizes. Getting that swag. Mm -hmm, exactly. We also had some Microsoft Store launch events. 13 Microsoft stores around the U.S. would host a launch party on November 14th, 2011, leading up to the release of Combat Evolved Anniversary starting at 10 p.m. Fans attending these events would have a chance to enter into special team death matches and 16-player matches, along with fueled with free monster energy drinks, pizza, and friendly competition. I love it. I love it. Why isn't this Halo now? <laughs> Fans would also be entered to win a limited edition Halo Anniversary Xbox if they played in the tournament. Additionally, the first 100 fans to arrive at each Microsoft store would receive special Halo items like posters and a grunt plushie. Out of the 13 stores, three would stand out above the rest, allowing fans to meet members of 343 Industries, Certain Affinity, and Red vs. Blue. In Houston, Texas, we had Certain Affinity developers and the creators of Red vs. Blue, so Rooster Teeth. In Los Angeles, California, Frank O'Connor and the 343 team. And back in Seattle, Washington, Dan Ayub, BS Angel, and the 343 team. So let's, let's talk about some... My favorite piece of marketing. <laughs> this is why I love the marketing sections and Halo 4's is even better. So Microsoft would look to Pizza Hut to release an official Combat Evolved Anniversary pizza available from November 7th 2011 to December 19th, 2011. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> this pizza was only available in the UK, though. Anyone who purchased a pizza would receive a two-day Xbox Gold membership code. So employees of Video Gamer would post reviews of the pizza, stating it wasn't quite like the original <laughs> Combat Vault. I love that. So... I need these type of things to happen all the time now. I need like a, a pizza professional artist at each of these. <laughs> so they're like, oh, we're doing Master Chief Helmet. All right. Throws the pizza on, <laughs> sculpts it. Right, that would be beautiful. <laughs> so then finally, just some additional marketing that I saw. There was a Combat Evolved anniversary longboard mm -hmm. that you could probably still get for 100 to 200 bucks. I've seen it float around online. Or make your own. And then... For original Combat Evolved marketing, there w there is a Combat Evolved anniverse or just original Combat Evolved floor mat out there. They go for a lot of money. Weird. I I, like I don't it. know. I that's what I love. I love seeing stuff like that. Like if you were like, here's this Clorox bottle, but it's Halo themed. Whatever. Mm -hmm. I would I people, actually probably wouldn't get it because hey, I already have oh, plenty. Are you Supreme? No, 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 no. Oh, because no. that's all Supreme does. <laughs> <laughs> they released those Oreos lately. Different discussion. But different discussion. Different anyway, discussion. let's jump over to really the most important aspect they added to the game, Connect integration. <laughs> uh, so Halo Combat Evolved was the first game to integrate Microsoft's new Connect with three major features that everyone immediately threw in the trash. Uh, you had voice commands. And with the voice commands, the player can reload, throw grenades, switch graphics, and more. Fans would have trouble with voice commands unless they had their TV volume low and had the perfect pitch and could kind of scream it, but not scream it, but have like a, a really powerful tone. Yes. That's the only way you could do it. <laughs> you had analyze mode. The player has the ability to scan enemies, weapons, vehicles, etc. These files will then be sent to the library. Wow. What is the library, you ask? The library. It's the hub for all information collected from analyzing in the campaign. Players navigate through the library with hand movements. So whenever you're laying there on your couch, you just start swiping your hand. Go. <laughs> See, that's all I used Connect for, was like lazily being in, I guess, high school and swiping through Netflix. So instead of just picking up the controller. Nope, Netflix, swipe. <laughs> that, controller's swipe. A, that controller's a middleman now. It is. Microsoft would state that these integrations are not meant to change the core gameplay, but rather enhance it. Oof. 343 Industries <laughs> was actually going to try to keep the Connect integration a secret. But during a demonstration, someone accidentally said a word that switched the graphics. 
<laughs> I was like, <laughs> graphic switch. Oops. <laughs> Why did they have it there? That's it, that's like saying Alexa on accident at times. And like, oh, sorry about that. But it's like if you're presenting a phone and trying to keep Siri a uh, uh, secret, just, just don't have Siri on there. Why, yeah, why is it connected? Plugged in. I, that's what I was wondering. Why is it there? Just, why? just have a <laughs> fake one. Anyway, <laughs> the box for Combat Evolved Anniversary actually does not advertise the Connect integrations, nor do they come on the disc. Instead, players would be able to download the integrations over Xbox Live on November 15th, 2011. Microsoft could not advertise a game that featured compatibility with the Kinect if it did not come with it on the disc itself. I do like that. I will say that's probably some jumbo they added in the last minute so they wouldn't have to make the Combat Evolved Anniversary box purple. Correct. I think that that was like a, mm, this is how well, we're going to do it. Well, and it's not a Kinect game, so it doesn't have to be purple. It just has integration in it. Okay. So they wouldn't have to change the cover, but this being the first IP that really uses it, you don't want it to be like on the box forever and it to be a big flop. Ooh, kind of like <laughs> it was. And for it to be stained on there. So now let's move on to the terminals. The terminals in Combat Evolved Anniversary were a way to explore 343 Guilty Spark's life from before the firing of the rings to present time in Combat Evolved. These would be the first video terminals in the Halo franchise, using a mix of motion comics and short animations. The terminals themselves were planted in the campaign in ways that would make them feel like a natural part of the environment, keep in mind on the remastered portion of it. Mm -hmm. So the terminals would also give players insight into Halo 4's story, as we said. And as I had mentioned earlier, Tim Dabo would return as 343 Guilty Spark to give new insight into his character Beautiful. when it came to these terminals. So that being said, we're tackling the campaign a little different. If you want a campaign walkthrough, go back a year. But here's the thing. Well, let's go back to that, that combat evolved. What was one thing I think we missed? What was one thing you think we missed? I think it was a little bit of a hashtag detailed walkthrough. Yeah, I mean, we never did really hashtag detailed walkthroughs, at least to an extent for that. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're bringing you for this one. So, of course, there might be some original Combat Evolved trivia that we're going to plug into each one of these missions, but what we're going to do is we're going to give you our true to hashtag detailed walkthrough, and we're going to show you where all the skulls are in this campaign. Mm -hmm. So let's start out with the first mission, the Pillar of Autumn. Escaped intact as Covenant forces board your ship. So let's talk about the first skull you can find in this game, and it is the Iron Skull, and it is located in the room you exit the cryo chamber in, and it's behind a set of purple containers. That's probably our most accurate hashtag detailed walkthrough. <laughs> I think that... <laughs> that one is like, that's it. You know it. You know the cryo chamber. It's, it's the starting mission, and it's go to the purple thing. Yep, exactly. So the Iron Skull will make a player go back to the last checkpoint in co-op if they die and restart the mission in single player if they die. Oof. Punishing. Mm -hmm. So for the original Combat Evolved trivia, let's talk about that a little bit. The Pillar of Autumn in the cutscene never moves. Instead, the camera always moves around it. We will be talking about this in the Cursed Halo episode. Mm -hmm. Slide of hand stuff is always so cool. Yep. To see stuff like that. So then also, all the Marines and everything have their own unique voices, but unfortunately they don't have their own unique faces because all the crewmen's faces are Matt Segur, who is the sound programmer for Combat Evolved. Now we've got Halo, the mission that I think really brought people People into loving the game itself. Mm -hmm. Seek out surviving Marines and help them fight the Covenant. So for that hashtag detailed walkthrough, the mythic skull, our second skull, is located to the right of the waterfall in the beginning of the mission. Honestly, I think we're getting great at telling people what these <laughs> are. You know where that is. The skull would give all Covenant enemies double health, along with enemy sentinels having overshields. Now we also have the boom skull, and that skull is located to the right on the cliff by the tunnel leading underground. And this is one of my favorite skulls. The skull gives explosions twice the blast radius. Mm -hmm. So then we have the truth and reconciliation. Board the Covenant ship in an attempt to rescue Captain Keys. So the foreign skull can be found in the room where Marines are dropped off for support. The player must kill all the enemies until the music starts. Rush through the doors where the third wave of hunters come from, and there you will find the skull. Bam. And the skull will not allow players to pick up Covenant weapons, so conserve your ammo. So when it comes to original combat evolved trivia, <laughs> this is hilarious. Originally, Keys would taunt dead AIs by unloading the Needler into their corpses, but this would always lead to an explosion <laughs> killing Keys. I mean, could you imagine that? You're like, don't pick the... No, 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 no. Like, trying to, like, <laughs> knock bodies off the edge so that it doesn't hit them. 
<laughs> yeah, they said that they, they tried to change it to when he had the needler, like it wouldn't super combine, but they couldn't. So they're just like, eh, screw it, we're taking it yeah, out. Yeah, to try because you basically had to program one gun into the game for mm-hmm. that. Yeah. And we're on to the silent cartographer. Search for the map room that will lead you to the secrets of Halo. And this is where we find the famous skull which can be found if the player turns around from the initial battle at the beginning of the mission. The player must then run up the rock structure and run across the flat land. The skull will be at the top. You know which one we're talking about. The warthog is flipped over by there. You know. You know. This skull will make any weapons dropped by enemies have 50% ammo capacity. And a bit of original CE trivia for you. This was actually the first mission designed for Combat Evolve. And the original theme or kind of original mission for you to do... Uh, was actually going to be to kill a prophet. Uh-huh, yeah. So we we kind of knew about them back then. Were they ever mentioned in The Fall of Reach? I Someone's going to call I us on it. Don't I don't remember. I believe so. I don't think we were doing that yet. I think they knew of a hierarchy system. I digress. Oh, well. uh, Unless, yeah, just prove us wrong. So now moving on, we have Assault on the Control Room. Defend the Control Room against wave after wave of Covenant troops. That's literally the whole freaking... Yes. mission but the bandana skull can be found by grenade jumping onto the ledge outside of the security control room and this skull gives a player unlimited ammo but turns off campaign scoring you little cheat mm-hmm. so then also we can find the fog skull and that's found on a ledge by the elevator and this skull disables the motion tracker you don't need it anyways and then finally the malfunction skull can be found on your side by the pipes by the gorge in the underground room hashtag detailed walkthrough you know exactly what we're talking about and this skull will disable random elements from your HUD every time you spawn like fun when we play it on our game nights yes I know everybody loves it it's my favorite game (laughs) and we're on to our little friend we're up to 343 guilty spark creep through a swamp to meet the only enemy the covenant fear Ooh. the recession skull can be found to the left of the structure at the beginning of the game when you jump down the hill past the th- enemy turrets this skull will make every shot worth twice the ammo so once again make them shots count mm-hmm. and a bit of original ce trivia for you the crazy marine was actually going to kill himself once the player walked far enough away and he was out of sight but Pretty morbid, and they make you want to do it yourself. <laughs> uh, I, I, they, there was an, uh, there was a reason for it. It was a bunch of techno mumbo jumbo that it, I don't well, want to type it, out. It, I think it's basically like after player gets to X or crosses X threshold, mm-hmm. make yeah, the marine animation, the and yeah. it's like, but why are we doing this if he's walking so far away? Like, you're gonna shoot him anyway. Yells are, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. They can make a sound effect for it. And Joe Staten wanted Marty to p- license paint it black by the Rolling Stones in this level when Chief watches what happens to Keys and the Marines through Jenkins' chip. Yeah. <laughs> what a weird tone that would have taken. Well, it was like it was like the most generic rock metal song, but yeah, then all of a sudden having Paint It Black, which is kind of a very obscure song, which still holds up today, just a side note, but that would have been weird. But God knows they didn't have the money for that. They probably no. went to Microsoft, and Microsoft's like, go to hell, finish this game, don't ask us this stuff. Yeah. So now we have the library. Fight your way through an ancient security facility in search of the index. So to acquire the Black Skull, the player needs to grenade jump into the event outside of the circular room in the first level. Mm -hmm. The skull makes shields only recharge when the player melees an enemy. So then we have the eye patch skull that can be found in the back room or the indexes. This skull disables auto-aim. Now to, I think, everyone's favorite level in this game that lasts forever. Two betrayals. Reactivate the weapon at the heart of Halo and learn the truth. Now, to get the pinata skull, you get a banshee at the beginning of the level and go back to the beginning to the ledge above the exit tunnel. The skull will be there. Mm-hmm. And this will cause meleeing enemies to drop grenades. There's there's no trivia that we have for you for keys, nor are there any skulls in that level. So we're just going to skip it because mm-hmm. it's, it's sad. I don't want to kill keys. So we have the maw. Destroy Halo before Halo destroys all life in the galaxy. Now, the Grump birthday party skull can be located on the rail to the right in the area where you see Fohammer get shot down. Rest in peace. Yep. The skull shoots out confetti when you headshot a grunt. Goes without saying. So now for original Combat Evolve trivia. For the legendary ending, Johnson was going to be in the longsword with Chief and Cortana. He would walk out and see them while he was brushing his teeth. I would love that. <laughs> like, <laughs> like that. that's how he survives it. He's like, yeah. oh. 
I, I was taking a break. I mean, that is like in first strike, that's how they find him, but instead he's just chilling. It should yeah. have been like he's in a towel brushing his teeth with his hat on. Like, yeah. that would have been beautiful. So finally, we have an additional skull. So, the grunt, you know, as we talked about, the grunt funeral skull can be obtained by purchasing Halo MCC, appearing in Halo Combat Evolved Anniversary and Halo 2 Anniversary. And this skull will make all grunts explode like plasma grenades. It's beautiful. So let's talk about the one thing I could find that was cut from Combat Evolved Anniversary, which was the Marathon logo, and it was removed from the original Combat Evolved logo. See, I think this is why 343 is cursed. They removed it. And we actually have a Combat Evolved Anniversary poster behind us, and it was replaced with like a little Guilty Spark thing. They said it's because they don't own the rights to Marathon. That's why they did it. I, I don't... I don't, I don't know. They said the same thing about when they cut Destiny when they ported it, or the Destiny po- poster... In ODST, when they mm-hmm. ported it over to MCC because they don't own it, but technically it never said anything unless Destiny Awaits is a copyrighted phrase, which I doubt it is. Yeah. So whatever. I mean, apples and oranges. And now jumping to achievements, this is the first time we're going to see them in Combat Evolved. Mm-hmm. Obviously, with the Xbox, we didn't have them. 360, we did. And so we would be able to have 44 achievements, totaling an average, totally an average totaling what they had, a thousand gamer <laughs> score, with an average of not that for people. <laughs> and obviously we had your achievements for completing each level, completing mm-hmm. on legendary, heroic, you know, all those things within there. Some level specifics, which were pretty fun. It's like on Pillar of Autumn, can put on legendary without picking up that overshield that you find in one of the pods. Mm-hmm. Yeah, overshields are for sissies. Mm-hmm. Don't pick up health, destroy three banshees in no fly zone. And ones that were added for three for three specifics were... What are we here? Read a terminal, read half the terminals, find all the terminals, and then find the skulls. Yeah, so pretty straightforward. And then, you know, the uh, piece of resistance, the one that you were going to work very hard on, was, uh, how do you say it? Sansa. Sansa? What's that even mean? Mm. Uh, okay, whatever. I, you know a lot more than I do. So complete any level with an iron and two other skulls active at heroic difficulty or higher, which heroic for me is pretty much a, a deal breaker so <laughs> all right so oh, now well. so now we have multiplayer so shortly after the release of halo reach 343 industries would have to make their toughest decision how to tackle the multiplayer they would partner with certain affinity to help develop combat evolved anniversaries multiplayer much to matt hoberman's delight who is the founder of certain affinity mm-hmm. so the new multiplayer mode would actually use halo reach's engine this is due to the fact that the original combat evolved had no networking engine and 343 industries didn't have the time to port over the original Combat Evolved multiplayer and still be able to release the game on November 15th, 2011. Because O'Connor estimated that it would have taken probably two to three years to accomplish, like, as a whole. So I don't know if that that estimate is correct. So luckily, 343 Industries would release a patch to the multiplayer for Reach and online co-op, so it would no longer require players to need that extra storage to play those modes. Remember we talked about that in our Halo Reach episode. Mm-hmm. So they're really trying to make this more open to people who are even casual with that that uh, four gigabyte hard drive. So 343 Industries also didn't want to take away from Reach's multiplayer population in the middle of its lifespan, allowing Reach's and Combat Evolved Anniversary's multiplayer to exist in one hub. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. So this would also lead to the two modes for the multiplayer. One in which the maps were just remade but stayed very true to the original, and the second mode where the maps were altered to fit Halo Reach's multiplayer gameplay, you know, that you had with the jetpacks and everything else. Yeah, all all your equipment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The first mode would feature the three-shot pistol, plasma swords, only blocking plasma swords, and the active camo was lessened. So they tried to make one mode as true to Combat Evolved as they could Mm -hmm. with Reach, which you got to respect that a lot. So the art team would spend hours during the evenings playing the multiplayer during development because, I mean, I think you have to. And overall, the multiplayer for the game took about 18 months to develop. Now, when deciding which maps would make it into multiplayer, certain affinity in 343 Industries would see which maps were fan favorites and which maps have aged well from Combat Evolved, Custom Edition, and 2. Frank O'Connor described this as an, quote, emotional process. Whatever you say, bud. You know, whatever. Hey, it's, I mean, it is kind of his baby-ish. As stated in the Halo Reach episode, 
343 did help with a minor portion of Reach's development. The the DLC maps, essentially. Yeah, pretty much. Max Hoberman loved the challenge of restructuring the maps and making them work for the engine. 343 Industries and Certain Affinity would actually use Halo Reach's Forge to help alter some of the remade maps. And some of those included Beaver Creek, Timberland, which was originally just a PC exclusive map, and they actually reduced the size by 20%, making it... 20% less? I mean, <laughs> there you go. We got Prisoner Remade, Hang em High, Damnation, Headlong, and Installation 4. Most maps that were remade for CEA would only have slight changes to accommodate Reach's engine. Max Hoberman loved the challenge of restructuring the maps and making them work for the engine. So now let's move on to, as I always state, my favorite portion. The Jesse edition portion. The, the, the Jesse part of the episode, music. So with Marty O'Donnell and Mike Salvatore leaving Halo behind to stay with Bungie, 343 Industries would look to re-record Combat Evolve's iconic soundtrack without them. 343 Industries would work with Pyramid Studios, the Skywalker Symphony Orchestra, and the Chanticleer Vocal Ensemble to bring the soundtrack to life once more. The soundtrack was recorded note for note from the original along with recreated synth patches. The audio team did this using the program Ears over the course of a couple months. Not as long as they would have liked though because I think I'm just going to assume doing something like this is very very monotonous. Like well, and, and note I, for note. That's what I'm saying. And note for note a lot of that boils down to yeah the program can kind of figure that out mm -hmm. but it's also like you're hearing it's like okay okay it sounds like it, I think. That's a B. It's, it's a B. It's B sharp. It's a B, B flat. Okay, uh, that's just a B, B. Um, this okay, is, this here we go. Is, uh, <laughs> I actually want someone to play B, B sharp, B flat, B, B. Yep, that's, that's the that official that Halo theme. Oh, that'll sound. And everything that was transcribed was quadruple checked. So 343 Industries would also work with Skywalker Sound to bring the new soundtrack to life with a 75-piece orchestra over the course of five days. I do love the fact that Marty O'Donnell was like, um, figure it out yourself. I'm not giving you my sheet music. Yeah. I'm not going to help with this because, you know, we've talked about a million times. His music is his baby. So they're like, hey, you want to help us with this? He's probably like, nope. Yeah. <laughs> when the graphics would switch between the original and remastered, the remastered music will stay the same playing on both versions of the graphics unless the players change the settings to only play the original soundtrack. When asked about this feature, Frank O'Connor confirmed it, but would say... Though I don't see why you'd want to. Chill out. All right, chill out, dude. <laughs> this has since been changed on the new MCC slash PC version. Because yeah, it just does it whenever you... It's it's automatically in there, so whenever you switch graphics, it plays that mm -hmm. music. Yeah, I think that's that's one of the few things I disagree with on this, doing that. Like, we won't keep everything original, except for one of the most iconic parts about it. We're going to re-record that for reasons. Yeah, and, and not allow it to go back and forth. We'll just keep the same music because you guys don't understand music. <laughs> yeah. So the soundtrack was originally released digitally and on a two-disc CD set. And for the first time on vinyl through something distribution, making it the first Halo soundtrack released on vinyl. So Christopher Melroth would act as the audio director for the game, and Brian Dale would play all the guitar tracks on the soundtrack. Breaking down the release versions, we have the OG standard version, we have the Platinum Edition, we have the Origin Pack, which was released June in 2013, and this version of the game came with Halo 4, the Halo 4 soundtrack, and a three-month membership to Xbox Live Gold. However, this was just an Asia exclusive. Yeah. You also have the Origins Bundle, which was, you know, Reach and Combat Evolved Anniversary that came out in 2013. Mm -hmm. Not to flex here, but I did just get a copy of it. Yep. Jesse wasted his money on a game <laughs> that is not playable for him. And then you also have the Master Chief Collection and released on March 3rd, 2020 was the PC edition of it. Mm -hmm. So now let's move on to the general reaction of the game itself. So Halo Combat Evolved Anniversary was something that fans have wanted since 2004 and something that they were thrilled to get. Alex Seropian, you know, one of the original or one of the co-founders of Bungie, had even played Combat Evolved Anniversary and he would state that, quote, it brought back a lot of memories. It was all great. Well, yeah, you made the game, dude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but in November 2011, video game sales worldwide would see Combat Evolved Anniversary as the third best seller in North America and the second best seller in Japan and popular in the UK on Amazon. All of this, even though Microsoft wasn't really pushing this to be a blockbuster title. Fans and reviewers alike would note that the frame rate tends to drop from time to time along with textures coming in late. 
Some fans would even point out that the Halo ring now has fins along the outside now, but 343 Industries would state that there were fins on the original Halo ring, but due to graphics at the time, we couldn't see them quite as well. I call BS on that. Also, these fins also needed to be there to play a part in Greg Bear's Primordium. That's more believable. Exactly. <laughs> and when game journalists would play demos of the game, there were two types of comments that arose consistently. Those who felt like this game felt like a modern day game, and those who felt like they were playing the original CE 10 years ago. Game Informer would state that it's a game perfect for quote-unquote, in-between gamers. Kotaku would outright say that you shouldn't buy the game. Other reviews would state that the Kinect had no reason to be a part of the game, which I think is the review for every single Kinect game, <laughs> since pushing the buttons was far easier than yelling the commands. And like you said, commands were like always delayed by a second or two to kind of process through, get it going, yeah. and not having that instantaneous response time. Reload! Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and like, or a grenade <laughs> or anything you need with it. Super dumb. Some awards and scores. Game ratings would give it an 82%. Metacritic, an 82 out of 100. Destructoid, a 9 out of 10. EGM, 8.5 out of 10. Game Informer, 8.5 out of 10. GameSpot drops a little bit to an 8 out of 10. Giant Bomb, 4 out of 5 stars, because why not? IGN's an 8 out of 10. OXMUS, 8.5 out of 10. PALGN, 8 out of 10. Digital Spy, 4 out of 5. The Escapist, 4.5 out of 5. Ooh. And finally, The Guardian gave it a 4 out of 5. It's given that average of 80% score pretty yeah, much across pr the board. pretty much. So Halo Combat Evolved was a game that started a cultural phenomenon that would lead to the transmedia universe we know today. Mm -hmm. With fans finally getting what they wanted in 2011, they were nothing short of ecstatic. So after the success of Combat Evolved Anniversary, fans were quick to speculate that Halo 2 Anniversary was in the works. When asked about this in 2012, a 343 Industries representative would state that the studio is hard at work on Halo 4 only. Microsoft also refused to comment on any rumors or speculation keep in mind though combat evolved anniversary was done after microsoft publicly stated they were in no way interested in remaking original xbox games so called them on that right there yeah and, and honestly they probably did it just in case the studio goes this is gonna flop they go, that's a, it under the rug. yeah and always like you gotta realize if you do say yeah we are working on this because how many games did they start working on even just early demos and said, we can't do this? Imagine if they had said, yeah, we're working on this, got everyone hyped, and then pulled the plug well, and everyone's the mad. Yeah, look at all the burn bridges that's happened. Like, look, whenever Disney bought Star Wars, you had, what was it, four or five different properties? They just went, nope, mm -hmm. you're done making that. Along with a whole universe. <laughs> but, yeah. But yeah, so with that being said, we know more now about the development and even some original Combat Evolved development trivia that I thought was just super cool to throw it in there. So now this is the point where we sit back, we relax, and we talk about what did we think about it. So as always, Alex, start us off. Sure. Uh, I mean, for me, Combat Evolved was the OG Halo game I played, I got into. I remember spending hours with friends doing some split screen you know, seeing rockets and, and getting all this cool, different multiplayer action and then playing through the campaign, you know, tens of dozens of times was amazing. However, for Combat Evolved Anniversary, it didn't hold that in my heart. Mm -hmm. That's I, fair. I, I think I was already past that point. Like, yeah, the nostalgia, same thing whenever I played MCC again, the nostalgia rushes back in. You're like, oh, I remember this part. Oh, that's cool. Look, they updated the graphics on this or look, this is here. But that was worn off. I played the campaign a couple times. I don't really think I touched the multiplayer. Oh, I, I did not. No, because I, like I said in previous episodes, Reach kind of burned me out on Halo. So this coming out as well, I, I played through them, but I just didn't have that same passion at the time. So I think it's great that they did it because it led to Halo 2 Anniversary, which is one of the most beautiful games I've seen in a while. Mm -hmm. So I really do appreciate that. However, I, I, it's there. You know what? I, I, it's there. It's great that it's part of the universe. It's great that eventually when MCC is there, we can flash back and forth to kind of see how that leap has come. I mean, as we talked about earlier, seeing ported games, seeing, you know, full rebuilds is really cool to see where we've come in terms of gaming with, with graphics, limitations in rendering and engines and, and what we can do today. Yeah. And something I forgot to, to point out is that it's, it's the, uh, the the MCC Combat Evolved original graphics 
are a downgraded version of the original graphics, if I'm correct. That's a whole late night gamer rant that I'm not going to go on. Yeah, you can see like what bloom they changed within pistols or how shields are different or Yeah, in, in the overall environment. But but again, I I don't I think that's such a minor thing that I'm not going to I'm not going to cry about it. So with with that being said, how I feel about it is that overall, I mean, it was cool. I I again, it was my first midnight release for Halo game just because I found about out about it a few weeks prior to its release, so you know, went and got it, stayed up late that night and played it a bunch. Um, and, and, you know, I've brought up my my best friend on here before. He's a super casual gamer. And, you know, he had played some Halo 2 and some Halo 3, but I don't think he ever played Combat Evolved. And so he, I, I, I looked at it after I played it with him from his perspective because he loved it. He's like, oh, my God, this is so amazing. Like, it, it was a fun game to play, and it looked amazing. And, and so for me, I definitely think that it is, like, that in-between game, you know, like... And it does, like, kind of bring some nostalgia to the table. I was never the biggest CE guy. Granted, I played it very, very late. But, you know, I, I played it, and we even talked about it in our original Combat Evolved episode that the game hasn't aged well. I think this this was definitely necessary because, again, what you said, it gave us Halo 2 Anniversary. Mm-hmm. And I think they really found their stride. They probably looked at everything that they did with Combat Evolved that they thought they could have done better. And, I mean, just did it tenfold. So, at the end of the day, I, I think it's cool. I still own it. it it's, I, like... Everyone wants, you know, to see that, you know, they wanted to see it with two. Now they want to see it with three. We're probably not going to get it for three, but I, but I appreciate it. I think it was just something really cool that they didn't have to do, but they they did it, and it sparked some joy and love for the game again. We got a very specific pizza out of it from the UK. That's what you need. That that tasted nothing like the original Combat Evolved. <laughs> so, <laughs> But, I mean, I think overall it was cool. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you know, you know it's, it sparks those memories, and... You know, I even remember some of my friends who were like you who had played the original one, you know, when when this release, we were like 18 or something. And so they were excited as hell to play it. And I think, and good for them by all means, at least within my circle, not a lot of people had anything too terrible to say about it. I think there are some things they should have fixed, like how when an elite falls over or a, a jackal falls over, their neck doesn't bend 180 or something like that some minor things like that they could have fixed but at the end of the day and it's not a real complaint that's just me saying you could have improved upon that but i think that also leads to the quirks of it they talked about Mm, like leaving bugs in and and little things that they try to replicate it but not be the same game but be the exact same game i I do love the fact that they had to go and put bugs back in Mm -hmm. i love that i mean and and you can't deny you got to give it up to three four three three industries because they could have just said you know what we are going to fix all these bugs we're going to make the most polished version of the game but they didn't they respected what bungie did and we you know we see later on and we'll talk about Halo 4, that they do start to really say, we're not going to do that because that's too Halo. Mm -hmm. So I was surprised to see that 343 Industries didn't actually change things around, but you got to respect them for that. I do disagree with how they tackled the audio thing, but I will say in their defense, I think that it was like a code thing where it was too hard to implement the audio back and forth. Well, you're jumping two engines, so I I understand it. But yeah, even though Frank Carr was like, well, why would you do that? Calm down, okay? But yeah, with that being said, that's our Combat Evolved anniversary episode. I think I I loved doing this just because the fact, A, I liked revisiting Combat Evolved, the original episode. Mm -hmm. I went and I listened to it, and I was like, man, and I'm not saying we're bad. We've gotten way better. It was so cool. We're still terrible, (laughs) but we're better than where we were. (laughs) We're just not that terrible. And I love that it lined up. I thought that was so cool. Not planned by any stretch of the imagination, but... But the forerunners looked down upon us. They said, we'll give you this one. We'll give you this one. And I'm very excited because actually our bonus episode does actually, weirdly enough, tie in mm-hmm. with Combat Evolved. Yeah, it's so weird. The one coming out next week. Yeah, so we have Halo Curse Edition, and it's a total look into Halo Custom Edition, which was the multiplayer that Gearbox Interactive, or Gearbox Software, whatever they're called. Uh, software. Software. <laughs> developed. Um, yep. So we're having that as a bonus episode, uh, dropping the week after this is released. And as always... This is voted upon by our patrons, uh, which Mm -hmm. we really appreciate. We have a Patreon, if you guys haven't heard it this far in every episode, where we have exclusive content, such as the bonus episodes that come out are voted upon, and you get them a month early, post-show, exclusive prints, discounts. We have Patreon game nights. We have like different chats and fun stuff that I really enjoy, and Mm -hmm. it, it really makes it work this. So... 
want to give a shout out to those people right now. We have Angry Canadian, Brenton Bagley, Charles Zitter, Kevin Fong Feliciano, D Gamer 1298, Dust Storm, Francis, Grant Dillon, Harvey Chong, James Yervasi, Jonas, Colonel Panic, Tactics, Dragonfire, Mr. Choff, Pasquale Orozco, Skyjack, and ZZ Slipaway. Thank you guys so much for your support and making this possible. Yeah, I mean, I love talking about where what they vote on on the Discord channel that we have for our patrons because mm-hmm. we do have a Discord that is welcome to any and all. If you are listening to this and you go, I can't find the Discord, look at the description of this episode it will be in there and we also have a facebook we have an instagram we have a twitter and you can find us on literally soundcloud spotify youtube stitcher anywhere that you you listen to your podcast we are there if for whatever reason we're not on that platform we're not going to be on that one we're <laughs> listen to a different one let's <laughs> but if there isn't one we haven't gotten yet please let us know and we will do everything we can to get on there but again that was combat evolved anniversary thank you so much for tuning in and other than our bonus episode coming out next week we will be jumping back into the greg bear trilogy and we will be covering primordium with that being said i'm your host jesse reiners and i'm your host alex kendall and thank you for tuning in to finish the fight a halo podcast